All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. In this lesson today, I'm going to be talking about intracranial hemorrhage. So this is going to be covering what the different types of bleeds are, how our patients get it, how they present with it, how we're diagnosing, and ultimately how we're going to be treating each of these bleeds. So stay tuned. I got a lot of great information for you guys on this subject. And my name is Eddie Watson, and welcome to ICU Advantage. And my goal here with ICU Advantage is to give you the confidence that you need to succeed in the ICU by taking these complex critical care topics and breaking them down and making them easy to understand. I hope that by the end of this lesson, I have been able to do just that, and perhaps I'll have earned a subscription from you. If you do, make sure you hit that bell and select all notifications. That way you'll never miss out when I release a new lesson. All right, so let's go ahead and get into our lesson here talking about intracranial hemorrhage. And the overall term is probably pretty obvious to most of you guys, but just so that we're on the same page, essentially what we're talking about here is a broad term that's used to define many types of bleeding that we have within our skull and or our brain. And so really pretty simple. So when we talk about these, though, we do have two big groups or types of these bleeds that we refer to. The first is what we call extraaxial hemorrhage, and this is where we have bleeding that's outside of the brain tissue. And then the other one is what we call intraaxial hemorrhage, and as you can figure, this is where we have bleeding inside the brain tissue. So there's a total of six different bleeds that I'm going to talk about in this lesson. Three extraaxial bleeds and three intraaxial bleeds. And so the three types of extraaxial bleeds that I'm going to talk about are going to be the epidural hematoma, the subdural hematoma, and the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then for our intraaxial bleeds, here we're going to be talking about our intraventricular hemorrhage, our contusion, and our intracranial hemorrhage. And so those are going to be the bleeds that I'm going to talk about with you here. But in order for you guys to really understand what these bleeds are and where they are, we actually have to move on and talk about a little bit of anatomy, and in particular, the anatomy of our meninges. And so essentially the meninges here, these are the outer protective layer and connective tissue that really covers the central nervous system, particularly here the brain and the spinal cord. And so the meninges here is actually composed of three primary layers, but I do want to talk about a few of the different things that we're seeing here. So first and foremost is this layer here. This is going to be something that we call our scalp. And the next thick layer here is actually going to be our skull bone. And then starting below the skull, this is actually where the meninges begin. And the first layer of the meninges that I'm going to talk about is something that we call the dura mater. And that actually consists of these two parts right here. And the dura mater is really a thick, durable membrane that's closest to the skull. So as you can see, this does consist of two layers, something that we call the endosteal layer or the outer meningeal layer, as well as the inner meningeal layer. So obviously the outer layer is going to be the one that's closest to the skull, and then that inner meningeal layer is going to be the one that's closest to the brain, but it does compose these two layers. Now one thing that's important to know is that there is this quote-unquote space that exists between the skull and the dura mater. So it's not truly a space. Typically the dura is sitting right up against the skull, but it is something that we refer to as a potential space. And this will be much more important when we talk about some of the bleeds here in a minute, but the first space that we're going to come across actually exists in between the skull and the dura mater, and it's something that we call the epidural space. Now, getting back to the dura mater, that this particular layer is going to be something that surrounds the layer below, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, and it really helps to support these things that we call dural sinuses, which are going to be these things right here. And these are responsible for carrying blood as well as some CSF away from the brain. Now, typically the two layers of the dura mater are right up against each other, but there are these areas where these two layers separate, and it happens in these four fibrous septa. So it kind of forms these folds that you kind of see going right here, where you have the inner meningeal layer, which will actually go down into these septa or folds, while the top layer goes across and basically forms these dural sinuses. Again, important to understand this and where this is happening because this will come into play later when we're talking about these bleeds. So now moving down lower, the dura mater actually normally sits up against the next layer of the meninges that we're going to talk about here in just a second. But once again, we have another one of these 
potential spaces. Again, it doesn't normally exist, but it has the potential to allow things such as, I don't know, perhaps blood uh, to go into that area, creating a pocket or creating a space. So this next potential space that I'm going to talk about is something that we call the subdural space. Now, we do have these things called bridging veins, which are essentially draining blood from the underlying brain tissue into the dura mater, and these veins do cross this potential space. Again, important to remember this. All right, so the next layer that I'm going to talk about is this layer right here, and this is going to be what we call the arachnoid mater. And this is essentially the middle layer of the meninges, and it's really named for this spider-like appearance that you kind of see here. And this layer is going to form the top portion of a barrier that helps contain our cerebral spinal fluid, which I'm going to talk about in just a second here. Now, once again, if we go a little bit further down here, we actually have a new space that does exist. So this is no longer a potential space. And this is going to be below the arachnoid mater, and this is something that we call the subarachnoid space. Like I said, this is a space that exists. And it's filled with these arachnoid trabeculae, which are these spider-like tentacles that you see coming down from the arachnoid mater. These are essentially strands of connective tissue that loosely connect the arachnoid and the next layer that's down below there. But essentially the subarachnoid space is going to be filled with this cerebral spinal fluid, which its goal is to cushion and protect the brain. So it serves as a shock absorber. Uh, it compensates for different changes in intracranial pressure, as well as it kind of helps to clear waste away from the brain. So it's a really important fluid that we have there, and this is existing within this subarachnoid space. Again, the top layer is going to be the arachnoid mater, but then the next layer below that, which really forms the other end of the subarachnoid space, is something that we call the pia mater. And the pia mater is this delicate innermost membrane that's covering the brain. Like I said, it forms that basement membrane that helps contain the cerebral spinal fluid above it, but this is the innermost layer of the meninges because then the next thing we see on here is our actual brain tissue itself. So that's the review of the meninges here. Like I said, it's important to understand this and understand these layers because as I start to talk about some of these different bleeds that we see, uh, especially these extra axial bleeds, that knowing the arrangement of the meninges will help you to understand the location of these bleeds. And so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about the first of the bleeds that we're going to discuss here, and this is going to be our epidural hematoma. All right, so first let's talk about where this hematoma is going to form. Well, hopefully you guys are able to figure this one out because we just talked about these spaces talking about the meninges, but you're going to find this bleed in the epidural space, which again is going to be that space in between the skull and the dura mater. So how is it that patients would get this particular type of bleed? So these are going to particularly be the result of blunt trauma and skull fracture. And if you're not aware of the different mechanisms of injury that we see with these head injuries, I'm going to link to the previous lesson that I did giving a good overview of traumatic brain injury. So I'm going to link to that up above. Make sure you guys watch that lesson so that you do have an understanding of these different mechanisms as I talk about how we get these bleeds. So what happens is we have a skull fracture that ultimately lacerates some sort of dural artery. Now the most common place for this is going to be the temporal bone fracture and lacerating what we call the middle meningeal artery. Certainly not all of the cases that we see, but definitely the most common one. Although we can also sometimes see this be the result of a laceration to one of those dural sinuses that I was talking about. So as you can imagine, in adults, this is really going to require a large force in order for this to happen. Now, the important thing to know with these bleeds is they almost exclusively are going to be an arterial bleed. So key to understanding some of what we see, which kind of really segues into our presentation that we would expect to find these patients... And in particular, talking about the epidural hematoma, there's the very classic progression that we often see these patients go through. Now, typically they don't all go through this, but most of them will. And this is going to be where they have a brief loss of consciousness. Then they're going to go into this awakened, what we call a lucid period. And that can be anywhere from minutes to hours. And then following that, there's this rapid deterioration in their mental condition. Now, some of the other things that you can see with this are going to be headache in your patient, progressive uh, obtundation like we just talked about, 
、uh, they could have this contralateral hemiparesis, or which is essentially that weakness on the opposite side of the body from where the bleed is. As well as we might also see ipsilateral fixed dilated pupil, and this could be secondary to something that we call an uncal herniation,、uh, leading to cranial nerve three palsy. So the herniation is going to be something that I talk about in a future lesson for you guys here.、Uh, as far as the cranial nerves, though,、uh, again I'm going to link to another lesson that I did here specifically talking about those cranial nerves. So. I'm gonna link to it right up above. So again, if you haven't watched that, make sure you guys watch that as well. So then the question becomes, how do we diagnose this? And for this, as well as all of the rest of the bleeds that we're gonna talk about here, the CT scan of the head is gonna be our standard for identifying and recognizing these bleeds. So here you can see an example of an epidural hematoma, and what we're looking for is this hyperdense, biconvex or lens shape to the bleed. This is one of the classic signs of the epidural hematoma, and the reason for this is it's not going to cross those suture lines in the skull because this is where the dura is going to be adhered very tightly to this. So we end up with this rapidly progressing bleed that will stop where these sutures are, where that dura is met up there tightly and containing this bleed, giving it that classic biconvex appearance. And so from there, we want to know how it is that we're going to actually treat these patients. And the epidural hematoma is going to be a neurosurgical emergency, so it can grow very rapidly since we're under that arterial pressure, and so immediate drainage is almost always going to be needed. In addition to that,、uh, as well as before we can get to that point of surgery, we want to be treating our patients ICP. So this is going to be things like giving them mannitol, keeping the head of the bed elevated. Uh, reducing stimulation; these different techniques that we have to really help to reduce the ICP for our patients. So that's going to be something that we do here,、uh, as well as for a lot of these other bleeds. When I talk about minimizing additional injury, the way that we do that is by treating the ICPs through some of the stuff that I just mentioned here. All right, so that was our epidural hematoma. Next, let's go ahead and move on and talk about our subdural hematoma. Now, for this one, hopefully you can figure this one out again by the name. But where we're going to find this one is going to be in that subdural space. So this is going to be that space between the dura and the arachnoid mater. Now, the way that patients can get this one is it's typically going to be caused by some sort of acceleration, deceleration, or rotational injury. And if you remember when I talked about crossing the subdural potential space, were these bridging veins. What happens here is because of the force that's exhibited, is we ultimately end up rupturing these bridging veins. And the reason for this is because the brain can actually move around inside our skull a little bit. But these venous sinuses, where these bridging veins are ultimately going to, are fixed in their location. And so, as a result, if the brain moves around too much, it can cause a tear in those veins and ultimately lead to bleeding into this subdural space. Now, in particular, the elderly and alcoholics who have atrophy of the brain may be more susceptible to this, due to having more movement available of the brain and already kind of having stretched bridging veins. So, even something like minor trauma, or sometimes even the case of spontaneously that these particular bleeds can develop in these patients. Now, as far as the presentation of these patients, in the case of the subdural hematoma, most often that it's going to be non-localizing,、uh, but may have focal signs, so specific localizing signs. And often we see a slow progression of these signs due to the slower nature of the venous bleed. Now, again, we could see the patients complaining of a headache. Uh, they could have this confusion or disorientation that is progressively declining in their mental state. And again, we could also see that contralateral hemiparesis,、uh, as well as the pupil dilation. Now, once again, we're going to be diagnosing this via a CT scan.、Uh, but as you can see here on the example, we have this really crescent-shaped hyperdensity, and sometimes they really can be quite large. But it's not going to cross these dural reflections, which is where the dura mater is going down into these dural folds that we had talked about. Now, along with all this, that we can see these midline shifts、uh, and compressed ventricles, which are really going to be a result of the mass effect of that bleed taking up space and pushing on the brain, pushing it out of the way. 
Now, as far as our treatment, once again, these are neurosurgical emergencies. So immediate drainage is often needed for these as well, as well as we may need to place a ventricular drain or an EVD to relieve pressure. Again, on top of all that, we are going to be treating our patient's ICP like I had previously discussed. All right, so that's our subdural hematoma. Now let's go ahead and move on and talk about our subarachnoid hemorrhage. And again, particularly in the case of what we're talking about here, this is going to be our traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is going to be quite different than other types of subarachnoid hemorrhages that we see, uh, particularly when we talk about hemorrhagic strokes. Um, but again, that's going to be stuff for a future lesson, and it's going to be distinctly different than what I'm talking about here. So here, once again, I'm sure you can figure out where this is, but this is going to take place in that subarachnoid space. Uh, usually, we're going to find these over the cerebral convexity, or essentially the surface of the cerebrum. Now, the way that our patients will get these is it's going to be caused by blunt trauma, causing some sort of acceleration, rotation, or shearing injury. And so what's happened here is this is going to result from the rupture of small arteries or veins that are on the surface of the brain. Sometimes we can find this in areas near where we have a skull fracture or some sort of cerebral contusion, which I am going to talk about in a minute here. But because of the openness of this subarachnoid space, we can also see things spread outward from things like a penetrating injury. Now, because this is a space that contains that cerebral spinal fluid, uh, we can also see things drain into the ventricles leading to a intraventricular hemorrhage, which again is going to be something that I talk about in just a minute here. Um, but it is important to know that it has been shown to have a poor prognosis when we combine a subarachnoid hemorrhage with other types of head injuries in trauma patients. So now the way that this is going to present in our patients... Now, one of the classic signs of the subarachnoid hemorrhage is something that we call a thunderclap headache, uh, which is really essentially the worst headache that somebody's ever had in their life. <clears throat> we could also see vomiting and seizures in these patients. Uh, obviously, we're going to see a decreased level of consciousness, possibly even coma, and then potentially focal changes based on wherever this bleed is impacting. Once again, we're going to be diagnosing this one with the CT scan. And as you can see here, this is where we're going to have these focal high density areas, uh, particularly in the sulci and the fissures of the brain. Now, as far as our treatment goes here, unlike the other subarachnoid hemorrhages associated with the hemorrhagic stroke, in the case of these traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, there's really not any surgical intervention that's available. Uh, again, we can use an EVD to help to reduce CSF and relieve pressure in these patients. Um, but again, primarily treatment is going to resolve around treating their ICPs and ultimately trying to reduce that secondary brain injury. Again, that secondary brain injury is going to be something I'm going to talk about in a future lesson here when it comes to management of these head injuries. All right, so that's our traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Next, let's go ahead and talk about something that I alluded to here in just a minute, but something that we call the intraventricular hemorrhage. Once again, I like to think the location of this one is pretty self-explanatory, but this is where we're going to have bleeding inside the ventricle system. Now, how do our patients get these? Now, typically these bleeds are going to be associated with that traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage like I just talked about, or some sort of intracerebral hemorrhage. But 30% of the bleeds that we see for these are primary. So in isolation, we're most often going to see this as the result of tearing of the subependymal veins. And these are going to be in the fornix, the septum pellicidium, or the chorid plexus. And this can be the result of either severe blunt trauma or some sort of penetrating injury, as well as things like diffuse axonal injury, deep gray matter injury, as well as a brain stem contusion. So lots of potential causes of the intraventricular hemorrhage. Now, the way that these bleeds are going to present in our patients is really going to be similar to other bleeds that we've talked about. So here again, we're going to see things like headache, nausea, vomiting, seizures, that altered mental status or a decreasing level of consciousness. Uh, but usually for these, it's going to be pretty minimal or even absent focal signs. Now, once again, we're going to be diagnosing this with a CT scan. And this one's pretty obvious because you're going to see blood in the ventricles on the scan. 
And then as far as our treatment for these patients, there's usually no surgical intervention. Once again, we can use an EBD to reduce and relieve those pressures, as well as treating our patients' ICPs, again with the goal of reducing that secondary brain injury. All right, so that's our intraventricular hemorrhage. Now let's move on and talk about something that we call a cerebral contusion. And this is actually going to be our most common intraaxial injury that we see in our patients. Now, where this is going to take place is going to actually be in this cortical tissue. Uh, and typically, we're going to see this in that coup or counter coup configuration. And what I mean by coup and counter coup, if you aren't familiar with this, what this essentially means is coup is where we have injury that's on the same side or the same location of where the particular force was happening, whereas counter coup would essentially be the opposite side. So if you can think about it as the brain jolts and moves to the other side of the brain, it can bump up against the skull on that side, causing contusion on the opposite side of where the force was. And that's going to be our counter coup. And sometimes we even see injuries that consist of both a coup and a counter coup. Like I talked about in the previous lesson, most often we see these in the cases of motor vehicle accidents. But I pretty much kind of led into how this happens. So this is where the brain is going to be impacting the ridge of bone or some sort of dural fold that's going to cause injury to that tissue. And this is going to be the result of some sort of blunt trauma. Now, the way that this is going to present in our patients is really going to range depending on whether we're dealing with a minor or severe contusion. But essentially, some of the things that we'll see are going to be the headache, confusion, sleepiness, dizziness, loss of consciousness, nausea, vomiting, seizures. And then we could see focal changes based on the location of where these contusions are. Now, once again, you'll probably never guess this, but this is diagnosed via a head CT. And here, as you can see, we're going to have these ill-defined hypodense areas mixed with these foci of hemorrhages. Now, again, it can be adjacent to the traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is common. And then if we follow up on these scans 24 to 48 hours later, it's not uncommon for these things to progress into more rounded hematomas. And then as far as our treatment goes, there is no surgical draining or intervention really available here. Uh, again, if we need to, if it's this severe, we can use an EVD to relieve pressure. And then ultimately, we're just going to be treating our patient's ICP, again, trying to prevent that secondary brain injury. All right, so that is our cerebral contusion. Now let's go ahead and move on and talk about the last of the bleeds that I'm going to talk about with you here. And this is going to be our intracerebral hemorrhage. Again, I imagine you guys can probably figure out where this one is, but this is going to be where we're going to have bleeding inside the parenchyma or essentially the brain tissue. Now, the way that our patients can get this is this is usually going to be the result of some sort of penetrating trauma, um, but it can be the result of a depressed skull fracture or less frequently these acceleration or deceleration injuries. Now, the way that our patients are going to present to us when they have this, again, it's going to be very similar to a lot of what we've seen. This is going to be the headache, vomiting, seizures, decreased level of consciousness, uh, as well as the contralateral hemiparesis. And once again, we're going to diagnose this via a CT scan. And here we're going to see a collection of blood that is within the brain tissue. Now, as far as our treatment, uh, it's still unclear if surgical intervention is really beneficial for these patients. So you might see that as a possible treatment option. Um, but again, for these patients, we could potentially be placing uh, EVD to help reduce that pressure, as well as treating those ICPs to prevent that secondary brain injury. All right, and that is going to finish up our intracerebellar hemorrhage. And that's going to complete this lesson here talking about these traumatic intracranial hemorrhages that we can often see in our patients. I really hope that you guys found this lesson useful. If you did, please go down below, leave me a like, leave me a comment, let me know what you thought. As well as if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel, that way you'll never miss out on any future lessons that I release. While you're waiting for that next lesson though, make sure and check out this awesome lesson that YouTube's recommending to you right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, and you have a great day.